The reality is that when someone close to you, particularly a child, disappears, vanishes from the face of the earth, the last thing you want to believe is that something bad has happened. Tracy goes back to the party and then goes home and life goes on. But life does not go on for Susie. They might, in their panic, do a very stupid and ultimately very wicked thing, and that is dispose of the body and go along with the fiction that she's a runaway. I'm Andrew Rule. This is Life and Crimes. This week we're going to talk about the disappearance of a teenage girl in the then country town of Hillsville back in 1987. Her name was Susie Lawrence. I use the past tense, was deliberately, because although no sign of Susie Lawrence has ever been found, no sign of a body, no proof of death, there seems no doubt that in reality Susie is never coming home. And it seems in reality that although she was posted as a missing person, and although some people claim to have seen her next day, the day after she disappeared, that in fact she probably met some sort of violence or foul play on the night that she was last seen by friends. We'll go back to 1987 in Hillsville. Susie Lawrence was the daughter of a local woman who'd moved back to the district after marrying and living in Western Australia, where she had three sons and her daughter Susie. I think Susie was the third of the four children. She was quite close in age and in friendship with her younger brother, Tony. The Lawrence's father, I think, had split up with their mother back in Western Australia and had, in any case, died a couple of years before these events. So he died in around 1985 of an illness. And so the four Lawrence children, or at least three of them, lived with their mother in Hillsville in 1987. And that is where Susie was going to school at the local secondary college. In 1987, she had had a serious accident, a very serious car accident in which someone was killed and she was very seriously injured and Susie was injured so badly that she'd been sent to Box Hill Hospital for many weeks to be treated with traction and other things because of broken bones and she missed so much school that she decided at the age of 16 going on 17 that perhaps she would try out working and she had a few weeks' work experience at a hairdresser's salon in Hillsville. But before the events we're going to describe here today, she had decided that she would go back to school and repeat the year that she'd basically missed. And she had started back at school and was getting along quite well with various friends. But she did have some of the usual teenage troubles, As a result of the accident, she had a bad limp, which was recovering, but she was still lame, and she was using a walking stick to get around because she had this injury that had not quite come good. That was one thing that's not ideal for a teenager. The other thing was that her first boyfriend, whose name doesn't matter to us here, her first boyfriend had broken up with her during the course of these events presumably sometime after she got back from hospital, she split up with the boyfriend, which is, again, relatively par for the course among teenagers, but it can seem important at the time. On the night in question, there was a 21st birthday to be held in what people in Healesville call the Memo. The Memo is the name for the local memorial hall. It's a rather grand I think, Victorian building in the main street. It's very close to Hillsville's other beautiful feature, Queen's Park. It's a large park in the centre of town, which has tennis courts in it and has winding roads through it, and it's quite a beautiful place. And on this particular night, February the 7th of 1987, Susie, along with some of her friends and others, were invited to a 21st birthday party 
at the Memorial Hall. Now, it was a slightly formal event. People dressed up for it. That wasn't sort of uh, T-shirts and jeans. 21sts, particularly in sort of more country areas, were regarded as a rite of passage and people tended to mark the occasion in a slightly formal way. And Susie and her good friend Tracy Squires had actually had a special shopping trip to Box Hill a few days earlier that week to choose and have altered long white dresses, which some people would say was something like a Deb dress or a formal ball dress, that sort of thing. They were long white taffeta dresses. The party happens. Susie and Tracy go to the party. Susie finds it difficult to dance because she has the sore leg and she's got to use a walking stick, so it's not much fun. She's also sees that her ex-boyfriend is there with another girl. It's not a particularly great night for her and she's tired and her leg hurts and she's a bit keen to go home. Around about, let's say, midnight towards the end of the evening, Susie and her friend Tracy pop outside and sit on the steps of the hall and Tracy says, look, I'll go back inside and get a drink, bring it out for you. Tracy goes back inside for a few minutes and, you know, has a quick chat, grabs a couple of drinks. By the time she comes back outside, Susie's gone. Now, of course, this is the era before mobile phones, so basically once somebody had left somewhere, you didn't know where they were until they got home near a landline where you might be able to call them at home. Tracy sees that her friend has gone. She wanders up to the corner of the driveway outside the hall and can't see Susie. That's fine. So Tracy goes back to the party and then goes home and life goes on. But life does not go on for Susie. Susie walks down the street with her stick and she sees two boys, two teenage boys that she knows well from school. Their names probably don't matter much to us here, but they are regarded as sane, sensible young guys who knew Susie quite well, were quite friendly, quite nice lads. One of them later went into the Navy, I think, for 20 years, and another one ended up, I think, being a tradesman or similar. Neither of them now live in Healesville, but they're now middle-aged men who recall these events fairly clearly. And their memory of it is that they spoke to Susie and said, oh, are you okay? Do you want us to walk you home? And she said, no, no, it's okay. I've just got to walk across through the park here. It's a bit of a shortcut. I can get home to mum's house pretty quickly through the park and see you later. So they said goodnight and they kept walking down the main street next to Queen's Park and Susie walked into the park, into the road that runs through the park. These young guys, I mean, they can't time it precisely, but sometime in those next few minutes, they noticed a tow truck parked near the tennis courts, and the tennis courts are inside Queen's Park. And they could see through the border of the park, the tennis courts and the car park next to the tennis courts and this tow truck sitting there, as tow trucks sometimes do late at night. They are parked in the centre of potentially busy places where people might end up needing a tow truck because they've had a prang or their car's broken down or whatever. It's Saturday night and so those sort of things do happen. The towies sit around and snooze or smoke cigarettes or sometimes possibly in those days they possibly drank beer. It's hard to know. These two young men noticed that as they walked along, after they saw the tow truck parked at the tennis courts, they heard a sort of a squealing of tyres and what they described as hoon driving. Now, they don't know what the hoon driving was and whether it was the tow truck or some other vehicle, they don't know. But what they do know is that within a matter of no time, they saw probably the same tow truck that they'd seen parked at the tennis courts emerge from the main entrance of the park and they said it was driving fairly fast and it turned onto the road and away it went. Now, they did not think much more about that. It wasn't that remarkable. 
But it later became interesting. And here's why. Because next day, Susie's mother, Liz, Liz Lawrence was her name then. Her name now is Liz Westwood. She remarried. Liz got up and she realised that Susie wasn't home. Now, she was a little bit concerned, but Susie was almost 17. So she was a young adult. Susie had lived away from home for some months, uh, boarded elsewhere, so she was fairly independent, but she was now living back with her mum. Her mother, Liz, was relatively relaxed and thought, oh, she will have stayed with Tracy or will have stayed with one of the other girls. It'll be fine. So she was pretty busy. She had something to do, shopping errands, so she went shopping out of Hillsville. I think she went to the city, into Melbourne, which was you know, 40 or 50 k's away, and she goes into Melbourne to shop and she comes back and she's got an agreement that she'll go to the local country music festival at the Yarra Glen footy ground. Now, Yarra Glen is a town also in the Yarra Valley, not far from Hillsville, just a little bit closer in, very short drive across the hills to Yarra Glen. It was a music festival, country music festival, so it was reasonably low key. There were several hundred people, but not thousands. You would think pretty well mostly local people who mostly knew each other, if not personally, then by sight. Now, Liz did not see her daughter Susie at that festival, which is interesting because when that night she became worried about Susie's whereabouts and reported it to the police, and the police started to poke about and ask a few questions, probably not very pointed questions and probably not soon enough, to be honest, but that's how it happens with missing people. The police poke around and they ask people who's seen Susie. Now, no one can now say exactly who said what, but it appears, and this has been repeated and repeated and repeated until people believed it, although it's probably wrong, one woman, a hairdresser from Hillsville, whose name we know, but we probably don't need to mention it, this hairdresser was a local person and she was married to local people. She had a business in the town. She was an established person. And she knew Susie quite well by sight and to talk to because Susie had, in fact, done work experience at her salon. And... This woman, the hairdresser, claimed afterwards to somebody, now whether it was to police or to just other people, is hard to know after all these years. She claimed that she not only saw Susie at the music festival, she said that she spoke to her. And she also claimed that Susie was with, quote, a lad, with a teenage boy that she didn't know, that the hairdresser didn't know. Now, That would appear to be pretty strong evidence from an eyewitness who should know what she's talking about and who should have no motive to tell an untruth and should just about get things right. And so Susie's mother, Liz, naturally seized on this report that her daughter had been seen at the music festival and believed it because... The reality is that when someone close to you, particularly a child, disappears, vanishes from the face of the earth, the last thing you want to believe is that something bad has happened. You do want to believe that they have gone off of their own accord and you are very anxious to believe and invariably probably do that if there's a report that they've been seen with someone, well, that's what's happened and they've gone off, you know, they've hitchhiked off into the sunset and living elsewhere and living a separate life and one day they'll turn up and of course you know six hours turns into 12 12 hours turns into two days two days turns into a week and before you know it your daughter has been missing for weeks and there's no sign of life there is no phone call there's no message no one says they've seen her there's no letter there's no sign that she's taken money from any bank accounts or anything. Now, of course, 1987 was a different time. Credit cards weren't used nearly as much as they are now. Basically, people dealt in cash. 
security cameras and dash cam and all that sort of stuff was not really around. They were things that came in later. And people in those days, in the 80s, could still vanish fairly well compared with these days when it's much harder. These days we have number plate recognition technology. We have cameras set up in hundreds and hundreds of streets and public places and in every second shop or store there's security cameras. And it's barely hard for people now to just drop off the grid and not be seen. And we all know that certain crimes have been solved because of mobile phone data, which of course didn't exist in the 1980s, because of credit card and debit card data, which largely didn't exist in the 1980s, and security cameras. None of those things were there to be mined by investigators, even if there were investigators wanting to look for Susie Lawrence, which it would appear they weren't. And one of the problems was, no doubt, that Mrs. Lawrence, the only surviving parent, basically hoped and believed, because she was full of hope, she believed that her daughter had run off with this unknown lad, this unknown young man. And she thought one day Susie will get in touch. She's probably, you know, living with this lad somewhere interstate or elsewhere. One birthday or one Christmas, she'll get in touch. Well, that didn't happen. And it didn't happen the first year. And it didn't happen the second year. And over time, poor Liz Greenwood came to realise that Susie probably wasn't coming home. She gradually came to accept that there could be a more sinister reason for her disappearance. I must add here that there was an alleged second sighting that some local person, again, this one is unnamed, no one seems to be able to put their finger on it, some local person claimed they'd seen Susie leaning or sitting on the bonnet of a car in the main street of Hillsville on the Sunday morning, the day after the party. It was a Saturday night party and that's when she disappeared. This person, whoever it was, claimed that they'd seen Susie talking to some young fellows in the main street of Hillsville, dressed in, you know, a pink top or something, which would mean, you know, she'd changed out of her taffeta ball gown. But the reality is this, and this has been pointed out by Susie's own friends, who are now, you know, middle-aged women, very sensibly, they say, okay, if she went somewhere that night, where did she go? Where did she stay? No one has ever come forward to say Susie stayed at our house. Susie came and, you know, changed her clothes at our house. Now, Susie wasn't carrying a bag with other clothes in it. She was just wearing her white taffeta formal dress when she was last seen walking into the park. She didn't have other clothes to change into. She told the young guy she met that she was going home to her mother's place. There is no sign that she stayed anywhere else. And so it seems fairly clear that something happened to Susie that night. Now, if the police are asked about this these days, if inquiries are made, and they have been made by a reporter called Emily Webb. Emily Webb started her journalistic career with leader newspapers out in the eastern suburbs in the Yarra Valley. And in the year 2011, so this is, what, 24 years after Susie's disappearance, Emily heard something about this case. I think it might have been, you know, Missing Persons Week or whatever. And Emily heard a bit about it and she went and saw Liz, who was still living in the town at the time and used to meet Liz, became quite friendly with Liz and felt very sorry for her and used to talk to her and they sometimes would have a meal together. And Emily, being friendly and warm and quite genuine, really, she wanted to help. And she wrote quite haunting stories about the disappearance of Susie Lawrence. And she was able to establish that really the alleged sightings on the Sunday didn't really hold water. Because when you approach the police about this uh, these days, you know, in the years since 2011, the police response is polite and it's restrained and it's non-committal. But essentially, 
it says that there are no reliable reports of Susie Lawrence's whereabouts from the time that she was seen after the party, when she was walking home after the party. In other words, what the police are implying but not actually stating is that the claimed sightings next day at the Yarra Glen Music Festival and in the main street at Hillsville are not corroborated and do not have any standing with the police. The police don't think that those have been corroborated and until proven otherwise, don't believe them. Now, that is quite interesting because the hairdresser lady who claims to have seen Susie and to have talked to her, to have spoken to her, she, to this day, still says that she saw Susie Lawrence. To this day, she says she talked to her. Now, that is quite extraordinary and no one can explain why she would do that if she's mistaken. It's one of the mysteries. The other angle here, and this is something we don't want to overemphasise, and we're not pointing fingers at anybody here, but the young men, the boys, teenagers who spoke to Susie on that night and are seen as very legitimate and honest witnesses and who still are, you know, they've been sought out by Emily Webb in recent times and she's interviewed them and she's interviewed Susie's mother and she's interviewed Susie's brother Tony and she's interviewed Susie's best friends from that era, her old school friends. And all of them are of the view now that something happened to Susie in the park in the minutes after she walked off the main street into the park on the night of February the 7th, 1987, Saturday night turning into Sunday morning. The young men saw a tow truck. They can't remember what colour the tow truck was. It was night time. There were sort of weak public lighting, uh, weak street lighting, so colours don't show up very vividly. You know, light colours would look light, dark ones would look dark, but the actual colouring, not so accurate. They have no way now of deciding whether it was, you know, a Heelsful tow truck or whether it was a Yarra Glen tow truck or whether it was a tow truck from Ringwood or any of the other nearby suburbs, Croydon, whatever, maybe even down to Pakenham, Cranbourne, it's hard to know, just which tow truck company it was. It's a mystery and therefore the police have never been able to establish exactly whose tow truck it was and therefore establish who was driving it. And the police are interested in establishing that because it seems a reasonable hypothesis, and this is just an educated guess, nothing else, a reasonable hypothesis that perhaps the tow truck driver, A, saw another vehicle in the park that might have had something to do with Susie's disappearance, or B, perhaps the tow truck was being driven erratically or fast and perhaps the tow truck struck Susie and uh, killed her. And perhaps that in either case, another vehicle or the phantom tow truck picked up the body and panicked. The driver might have panicked and thought, well, I've done this. I've had a few drinks. I'm in big trouble. If you uh, imagine somebody who's had a couple of cans of beer, they might think they're 0.05, then they've run over a local teenager and killed her. They might, in their panic, do a very stupid and ultimately very wicked thing, and that is dispose of the body and go along with the fiction that she's a runaway. Now, it's conceivable that a relatively honest citizen could do this if they were panic-stricken enough. that They may not do it with a eight-year-old child, but with somebody that's relatively grown up, they might assume, well, she could have run away anyway. They won't know the difference. No one will be sure. I'm going to go and bury her up the bush. Now, there are rumours to this day in Healesful about various people and various possibilities Rumours are dangerous things and often wrong 
and often just ridiculous speculation. There's no point repeating them here. But the idea that someone could run over and strike somebody and kill them and then, in a panic, bury them somewhere, dispose of the body somewhere, does make a lot of sense. There's probably not a lot more to be said on the record about that possibility. There is, of course, a third and even more sinister possibility that someone abducted Susie that night and then killed her and disposed of her. That is always a possibility. And we know that of all the hundreds and hundreds of people who go missing each year, that most are found fairly rapidly, that many others are found in the fullness of time, you know, within weeks or months or years, but that a percentage are never found and that each year in Australia some people disappear from the face of the earth and are never seen again and that among that group there must be not only suicides and people who accidentally drown and are swept out to sea perhaps or eaten by you know sharks or whatever but there must be murder victims as well whose bodies are disposed of so the mystery of Susie Lawrence was she accidentally run over and disposed of or was she abducted and killed the only thing that everybody concerned seems fairly sure about sadly is that she's dead and therefore she's not coming home. There is more to this story. Emily Webb, uh, the former leader, uh, reporter, now works outside newspapers, but she and her colleague Michelle Laurie run the Australian True Crime podcast, which is a very successful podcast. And Emily has done a very powerful podcast about the disappearance of Susie Lawrence in which she interviews Susie's friends and relatives. And it's a very affecting piece of work. And there is no doubt that there is more to this story and that someone somewhere who have listened to the Australian True Crime podcast or maybe are listening to this one or maybe someone who read the story we ran in the Sunday Herald Sun a couple of weeks ago, that someone out there might just have a clue about what really happened. Because Hillsville still has many of the same families that lived there in the 1980s. They're still there, different generations of them. It's a town that's small enough to have its secrets and its whispers and its sorrows. And sometimes people in Hillsville, when they think no one is listening, they tell each other what they think really happened. And that is about as close as we can get to the mystery of the disappearance of Susie Lawrence. <laughs>